is an awesome God. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. Why is that? Because even God never gets upset with any one of us. Hallelujah. Because his grace always is there. His grace is always there. There is no level to his grace that we can never get to because his grace is boundless. Yes. He has more grace than what you, I, or us can ever think of because we serve a great and Hallelujah. living God. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. We thank God um, for all of you all that are out here for our Kingdom Connect Wednesday um, as we will be having this Bible study on family matters. Family matters. God made it pretty clear that families are important when he created Adam and Eve. The Holy Bible calls them man and wife in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it says man and wife. And the first commandment God gave them was to have children. That was the first commandment God told them was to have children. As you look in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, Genesis chapter 1, Verses 27 through 28. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And then the 28th verse says, And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 1. So families are central to God's plan for his children. They are the fundamental building block of strong societies. Families are where we can feel love and learn how to love others. Life is tough, and we need people we can lean on. Home is a safe haven where we can get love, advice, and support. At least it's supposed to be. Our family here on earth is organized like our family in heaven. Much like we can go to our parents for advice, our Heavenly Father is always there to give us help. When we pray, He listens and He will answer. How do I know that? In Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. It says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. So God loves us so much. He loves us even when we make mistakes. And he always invites us with open arms to return unto him. We glimpse our Heavenly Father's perfect love for us in the profound love many parents have for their own children. We can all experience Heavenly Father's love as we grow closer and closer to our God, who is our great father. He is our Abba, our father. And we can share that love with our families. 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 We all have one. Whether it's a biological family or an adopted family. Families change when babies are born or adopted and when marriages and deaths occur. When one gets married, it's normal to accept their spouse's family as their own. And there are times when, after the death of a spouse, the widow or widower maintains familial relationships with the family of their deceased spouse. 
If one remarries, then the family continues to increase in size. So family is an important concept in the Bible. God instituted family when he created Eve as a helpmeet for Adam. The rest of the Bible speaks of family in its various roles. And most important is the church as God's family. So I'd like to ask you this question. Why is family so important in this world? Why is family so important in this world and why? Mm -hmm. Family is important because we depend on each other for dependability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we are helpmates to each other, just like he wants to Adam. Mm -hmm. right, right. And, and having a big family, I, I've learned a lot of things. You grow together, you learn together, you learn hopefully wisdom together, and you grow up to be good people, but yet you have people you can always count on when you're down. You got a uh, family that celebrates when you're up, and hopefully they never leave you. And I have five sisters, two brothers, and I can call most of them any time, that I want and I need them, and I think without family, you're going to be a very lonely person. Yeah. 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 Very, very lonely. That's true. So without family, you'll be very lonely. And family should be ones that you can talk to and just lean on them for support whenever you need that. Right? So, so the Bible defines the family as do we. Those of the same household, that being the pairing of a husband, this is a man, and wife, who is a woman, right? And we're talking about the chromosomes at birth, what that was. Was that was it XX or XY, right? Yeah. That's what makes a man or a woman, not who they chose to be later on because that's not in the will of God, and that wasn't God's intention of when he created us to just say, okay, well now tomorrow, now I'm a woman, Amen. but you still look exactly like a man, right? Or a woman, right? Says, oh, tomorrow I'm a man, but you're yet a woman. And then forget about when we were talking about the, the non-binaries who like to say that they're neither sex, Oh, although you look just like a woman or you look just like a man, but you're still saying you're, you're not really um, related to a sex because you don't really feel like you're neither one or the other. But that's not what God says and not what the Bible says. Yes. But this household is the pairing of a husband and that husband is a man and a wife and that wife is a woman along with their children, along with their children. That is a household. That is a godly household. That's the intention of God's purpose for family. Because God created the family, he is intimately involved with each one. Scripture is our great instructor of monogamy, the lifetime union of one man and one woman and merits as the foundation of the family. Yes. Reference in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. So throughout the whole Bible, the institution of family as the model God created it to be is prevalent. All other relationships are to stem from the family. God's building block of society. The family is God's building block of society. If we regard the Ten Commandments, we see the first four concern our relationship to and with God. 
and the other six speak to our relationship with others. Three are directly related to the family. The fifth commandment says to honor one's father and mother, which is the family foundation. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, the fifth commandment says to honor one's father and mother, that the days may be long upon the days that the Lord thy God giveth thee. The seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Thus preserving the sacred nature of the family. The 10th commandment, you shall not covet. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Speaks to God's command for fidelity of heart. For within a family, it is not good nor godly to covet what others have, including a different family. Does anyone know what that word covet means? To possess? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not just to possess. Covet somebody else's wife. Right. Or yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so if you covet something, you eagerly desire something that some one else has right so if it's 95 degrees outside right it, then you may find yourself coveting your neighbor's air conditioner right if it's if it's zero degrees outside and, and you have no heat right then you're going to covet your neighbor's heater that they might have right you're like i want that so this was the same thing what it was talking about in the scripture where, where it pretty much was like you shall not covet your neighbor's wife because then some that's speaking of lust, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, oh, I really wish I had her mm -hmm. or that child there. I really wish I had that child. But, but the thing is that we shall never covet anything because we need to have what is ours and we must take those things and, and not covet anything else. So just be thankful for what you do have. Be thankful. That's what God was really trying to teach us was to be thankful for the things that you have. Don't, don't try to covet um, what other people have because sometimes you don't know what they're going through behind closed doors. It might look perfect, perfect family, to you on the outside, but on the inside, mm -hmm. something different, Not all that dysfunctional, mm -hmm. dysfunctional family. <laughs> we'll talk about that next week. Because so Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts, mm -hmm. murder, adultery, sexual immorality, death false witness, and slander. So actions proceed from the heart's intent. And God is all about preserving the family as he created it to be. He therefore gets the glory. So the New Testament includes historical narratives and epistles which include instruction and reiterations from the Old Testament and Jesus' teachings as to what the family is to be according to the word of God. Paul spoke to them when he said in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, mm -hmm. for this is right. Yes. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, Colossians chapter 3, mm -hmm. verse 20, it says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So why is family so important to God? Why is family so important to God now? Not to the world, but to God. 
He gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. And to, for him to do that, glorify family, I mean, to the umpt degree. Right. You can't do anything more than give your own child up to be sacrificed. Right. And I believe that family is everything to him mm -hmm. for what he did. And, and if we do any less, we're slapping him in the face. We're just basically turning our back to him. Right. He, he worshipped his family enough and worshipped your family and my family enough to send his only son to be killed on a cross. That's right. So if you take family lightly, he's going to take you pretty lightly. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's good. I like that. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's a good angle. And you see, you know, common when it's true. Family is important. So to add on to what he said, you know, God created family. It's an institution. So anything he created, he values. Mm -hmm. And um, even with Adam and Eve, because I see a pattern man and woman, husband and wife, you know, that's where family comes from. So for him to create Adam and Eve, it's an institution which he cherishes. So that's, that's right. why it's important. That's right. Amen. Thank you so much for those answers. So so God uses families throughout history to enact his will. The promise God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, involves family. It says, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So shall your offspring be. A later unfolding of the Abrahamic covenant reveals more details as God tells Abraham he has made him the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. So God established his everlasting covenant with Abraham. And his family was in that covenant. Thus began a family too large to number. Even as we think about um, many of the families, let's think about all the many people that were born even beyond Jesus Christ that were a part of Abraham's family. So now think about today in this world, the billions of people that are here the billions of people that have already died in the past, right? It's innumerable. We can't even count how many descendants came from Abraham. And within the family of Abraham, offshoots came. The most significant is the progression of families was led to the birth of Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. We can trace his genealogy at Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, and Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. Matthew chapter 1 actually gives you a, a genealogy trace from Joseph's side of the family. And then that Luke chapter 3 gives you a genealogy from Mary's side of the family. So not an insignificant aside is God used all sorts of people, including a Moabite woman, Ruth. And, and in Ruth, there was a, she was a prostitute, right? Or I, mean, I mean Rahab, rather. Rahab was in the book of Ruth, right? Rahab in Joshua chapter 6, verse 23 and 25 talks about the prostitute, all came from his lineage. There was an adulteress in his lineage. The point is, God shows no partiality. And he will use families for his purpose in his perfect timing. So is our family only biological? Is our family only biological? 
No, because we have the church family. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be biological. But in a way, it is. We are all bio biologically related in a way since we come from Abraham's descendants. So <laughs> looking at it that way. Definitely not yeah. bio. It doesn't have to be biological. Right. There's no possible way. Yeah. <laughs> Because biological families split, and they remarry, and they have non-biological uh, members of the family who they love more than anything in the world. Mm -hmm. Families extend it as far as your heart can extend. That's right. And to me, I have a stepbrother who's not biologically related to me, and I love him more than my real brother. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Because we have a lot of things in common. Mm -hmm. I don't judge. I don't do anything, but I think family is, could be anybody who has respect for you mm -hmm. and honors you. Right. Like right. you, right. your wife, I, mm -hmm. we could be church yeah. families yeah. because there's mm -hmm. a mutual respect and a mutual common denominator between us. Right. We all have the same beliefs. That's and right. there's nothing's going to change my faith, not mm -hmm. this lifetime. Right, right. And I know nothing's going to change her lifetime. <laughs> or yours. Yes. And that I can tell you. That's right. You know, so that's that's what I believe. Like mm -hmm. growing up, there was a saying I used to hear: "Blood is thicker than water." But when you're thirsty, you don't ask for blood; you ask for water. So that was a way of also telling you that you people might have the same blood, but when you're thirsty. It's what I ask for. So it yeah. goes ahead to say that it's not just blood relation that makes family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, unless, unless you're a vampire, then oh. you might want yeah. the blood. <laughs> <laughs> Get blade. <laughs> he needs it so he doesn't become fully, right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't go after the humans. <laughs> that was a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. Was a very good movie. So, so is our family only biological? Happily, no. As Christians, we gain a twofold family life when we accept and proclaim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. In one sense, we do not we do have biological families, those who belong to us in the way God intended. For example, a mother, father, and siblings. In a second sense, as people belonging to Jesus the Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. You can reference that in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. Actually, I think I will go ahead and read that scripture. If you have that. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. Yes. Okay. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. Romans chapter 8, 16 to 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in the same suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Mm -hmm. and, and that was amplified? Or NIV? Yeah, this is uh, NIV. NIV. And um, the King James Version says the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. <laughs> Look at that. Joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So let's look at all of the wonderful things that Jesus has done for us, and yet we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thing to know. 
So Christians who have been adopted by other families here on earth or part of a threefold family, so be biological, adopted, and God's family. Biological, adopted, and God's family. We can consider the family as a model for who we as believers are as God's children. Each Christian is a child of God. And according to God's design, we have each have a father, a mother, and siblings usually. Each part of a person's biological family is to act as God has mandated in his word. And each spouse is to be one with the other, just as we are one in Jesus Christ. As far as the three possibilities, only one will endure forever. And that is what? Which family will endure forever? God's family. God's family. That's right. That's right. God's family will endure forever. That, that's why I often tell my, my wife, um, Lady Kangan, I say, you know, oftentimes, you know, we always want to pray for family, want to get together with them and everything. But the fact of the matter is not all of the family is actually going to be going to heaven. Yeah. So our real eternal family is going to be those are, that are in the church, the body of Christ, that are that have been saved from their sins, that repented, and that are living right lives, right? Those are going to be our true eternal family members. So that's the one thing to always remember. Yeah. Because oftentimes we're trying to get, because really we can only draw people through Christ through loving kindness. That even comes with family members. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to even family members, if they don't want to accept Jesus, we can't force them to accept Jesus. So we want to have the real family that's going to be caught up to meet him when he cracks the sky. I know my wife likes that. Cracks when he cracks the sky. She's like, "What is that?" <laughs> when he opens. Fury. <laughs> a lot of fury. <laughs> Oh, man. So, so we are indeed to love our biological family. Yet we will spend eternity worshiping the Lord with our church family, yes. which may include members of our biological families. Jesus said in Matthew 10 and 37, as I come to a close, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Again, that first part says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's talking about that you love your parents, you love your father, your mother even greater than you love God. That's totally backwards because God is supposed to be the number one person, the number one individual that we love the most in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Again, we can't put our sons or daughters even above loving God. We cannot love other people more than we love God. Mm -hmm. But when we learn to put it in proper place and proper protocol and order, then when we love God, right, that love will then rain on down to other people. But that love cannot just be first on an, a human being, but it must be on the divine God that we serve. We see the demonstration of a good family in Abraham, by Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. He was to teach his children to do justice and righteousness. 
We also see a demonstration of a good family from Jacob in Genesis chapter 35. Jacob commanded his family to purge foreign gods and honor God alone. To purge foreign gods and honor God alone. Yeah, as we think about those little idols, a lot of people, first thing that comes to their mind is going to be like, Oh, look at all these statues that the Roman Catholics are praying to, right? Because those are foreign gods. Those are idols, right? Because the only person, the only person that is a mediator between God and us is Jesus Christ, not an object. So a lot of people would think about those statues, right? This saint or that, or here's Mary. Let's pray to Mary. You don't pray to Mary. You don't pray to Saint Thomas or anybody, right? You pray to Jesus Christ, to your Father, right? So the thing is, we oftentimes think those are the only idols in life. No. But an idol can, is anything that you are putting before God. Mm -hmm. That could be a career. Mm -hmm. That could be your, your family that you want to put before anything else. Like, like, you can't make an excuse when you come to Jesus. Oh, why weren't you there at church? Oh, we had a family event we had to go to. You know, we had a family reunion. There's always something you're doing, right? You're always doing this, doing that, or going there, going there. But then you forget about Jesus. You forget about your commitment and dedication to the house of the Lord. Another person that demonstrated a good family was Joshua. Joshua chose for his entire house to follow the Lord. And that's what every leader of their household was the husband, right? A husband ought to make sure that the entire house is to follow after the Lord. Also, David. David bless his household, his entire family. Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he, he was an adulterer, right? Slept with another man's wife. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then on top of that, sent the, the, sent the man to the front line. And then had him killed. I don't know if that was first degree, second degree. I would say a second degree, but he was very intentional about it. So he might as well be first degree murder, but also a murderer, right? An adulterer. And, and then all of the different other things. But yet the most important thing we have to know about David is not about how many wrongs that he did. It wasn't about what he did wrong. Because again, as I said on the offset, right, is that grace, God's grace, right, abounds. God's grace is always there available to us, especially under this new covenant of grace that we are living in today. So, so the thing is, we cannot abuse grace, but we must know that God is always there for us because he loves us despite our wrongdoing sometimes God is not mad at us God is not mad about us just just repeat after me say say God is not mad at me God is not mad at me but God is madly in love with me but God is madly in love with me yes yes and then the last person is Job Job prayed for his children, lest they sinned. Job was an upright man, a righteous man. And yet, he still prayed for his children. Even when his wife wanted him to curse God, give up, throw in the towel, he yet prayed. Job was an upright man. That's the type of family we need to be. Those are the type of leaders we need to be in our households or those that are upright and righteous. And God will complete the work through us because he's already done it. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we do thank God for this time of this Kingdom Connect Wednesday. Getting with the prayer going through our KLT Bible.